Hey, would you guys stand with me as we worship the Lord and just start this morning in his presence? Father, we're here to worship you and we're here to glorify your name. We're here to fall more in love with you and your son Jesus and all that you've done for us through his death and resurrection and the eternal life we have. We thank you, God, for the forgiveness of sins. We thank you that we have eternal hope in Christ. And would you just fill this place with your love, fill this place with your holiness and your presence, that we would be astounded and a church in awe of you this morning. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The kingdoms will bow down. And every chain will break as broken hearts declare his praise. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring in power and fighting our battles. Every knee will bow before Him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sins of the world. His blood breaks the chains. Every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. And every knee will bow before Him. And open up the gates, make way before the King of Kings. God who comes to save is here to set the captives free. For who can stop the Lord Almighty? Sing it out. Our God is a lion, the lion of Judah. He's roaring in power and fighting our battles. Every knee will bow before him. The Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sins of the world, His blood breaks the chains, and every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb, every knee will bow before Him. stop the Lord Almighty? Who can 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 stop the Lord Almighty? Stop the Lord Almighty. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring. 
that you are a good father who loves us. We're so glad that you condescend to meet with your people. We're praying that your presence would fill this place, that you'd speak through your word this morning, that you would be rich in our fellowship, that your grace would flow through one another here. Thank you for the family that you've called us to be and the part we get to play in your eternal purposes and kingdom. We're rejoicing in you this morning, God. We pray it all in the name of your son, Jesus. And everybody said, amen, amen. Well, welcome everybody. Let's go and take some time, greet some people around you. Let's welcome each other in the Lord this morning. Feel free to stand up with us as we worship. We have a new one for you this morning. So sing it as you know. Worthy. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise you could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Jesus, the name. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one you could ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you. Right. 
As we sing this next song and just preparing our hearts for the, the word of God to come upon us and take root in the good soil of our hearts. Let's just think upon the holiness of God. God who is holy that no eye can see or has ever seen, yet has condescended and come to us in flesh through Jesus Christ and saved us by his blood. Amen. Let's sing this together. Holy, holy, holy. shall rise to holiness three in one Evermore shall 
Holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. Though the darkness hide thee, though the eye of sinful men thy glory may not see. your name by the grace that you have given us and stirred in us and changed us and made us into worshipers of the living God. We just respond with praise and thanks and love and adoration to your holy name. There truly is no one like you, God. You are incomparable, matchless in every way, the only holy one the one true living God. And it's your word that we seek to hear from now, what you teach your children and build your church that we might reach the lost. Do that work in us through the power of the word and the spirit working in our hearts. We pray it in the name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen, amen. Go ahead and grab a seat. Being here. Uh, if you'd open your Bibles up and can get those ready, uh, we're going to be in 1 Timothy chapter 1 again today. Also, welcome to our online viewers. I uh, hope that you're having a wonderful Sunday. We hope that you're blessed by being here with us today. I do want to open us up with a word of prayer. Father God, as we come to your word, we ask, Lord, that you would open our eyes, Lord, spiritually in our heart, Lord, that we would hear a message from you. Your word teaches and instructs and guides us. It corrects us, Lord. It brings us closer to you. And it shows us who you are. Lord, it gives us assurance of what you have done and are doing and what you've promised to do. And in this, we find great hope and confidence. So Lord, it's just a blessing to be here today, to have your word in our hands, that we can dwell on it, Lord, to make it part of us, Lord. And we just ask uh, that you would help us to make it application for us as we grow closer to you through it. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So last week we started uh, this sermon, and, or the series rather, in 1 Timothy, and we got to know uh, the guy at Timothy just a little bit, and we started talking about how he made his transition from this person who came to hear about Jesus to becoming a leader in the church. And we talked at length some uh, time, last week rather, about hope, about the hope that we have in Jesus and what, the expectation of what hope really is. Uh, hope defined is the desire, the expectation, the anticipation of something better ahead. Here's good news. This is not as good as it gets. <laughs> now, as good as you might have it here today, it's, this is not as good as it gets. As bad as everything is today, what a blessing it is to know that this is not as good as it gets. There is something so much better ahead. 
For those who haven't accepted the Lord yet, who haven't known that release of their sins and are still walking around in their guilt and a condemnation of all the things that they've done, just like that kid when he came home and he had done something wrong at school and he's bringing that letter home from the teacher that has the frowny face on it, it says you have to give it to your mom, your dad, and it has to come back to school the next day with that signature showing that you showed it to mom and dad. And on the school bus ride, the whole way home, you were practicing mom's signature. What a great release it is to know when we get home and you show that to mom, you show it to dad, and you have that talk with them and they, and they encourage you and they tell you, you know, you can do better than that. You know, I know I can do better. And, you can, and they give you that release. They give you that forgiveness. And they tell you that they're proud of you and they love you. And they encourage you. So many people out there today don't know that release in their lives. They're still going through life with that note in their pocket saying that there's judgment coming because they haven't known the release of the forgiveness of their sins by Jesus. They don't have that hope realized yet. And we realize that Christ is our only hope. We have the knowledge, we understand that we're not justified by any of the things that we do. We understand that we've all fallen short of the glory of God. People will argue and say, you know, that, you know well, they're good and, and that they have done good things in their lives, but we know that none of us is good enough. We know that none of us, without God's blessing, without having that forgiveness of the Lord, that we're going to be held accountable for our own actions. We have this hope of looking forward to having that relationship with Jesus. And they, they don't have the things that we realize. And we take for granted things like God's protection. Day by day. Getting home from, from work every day. Getting home and you know, making it back to the safety of your home every day is a blessing. And we take for granted some of those things. The day by day, the blessings and protections that we have. We take for granted the things that they, like having peace with God. It is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of a living God. God who created all things and, over all, and it is over all things, and yet we have peace with him through our relationship with Jesus Christ. And yet there are people out there that don't know that and don't have that hope of protection or peace or blessing from the Lord. And again, we know that once we were just as they were. The only difference between us and them is that we read the word of God, we heard the word of God, we heard the message of the Lord, and we said, I believe and I trust, and we asked Jesus. He said, Lord, I, I want that protection. I want that forgiveness. I want that blessing in my life. And we accepted the Lord as our savior. The Lord extended that blessing onto us. I said last week that we were talking about hope. We asked about that convicted murderer, that felon, that, that rapist, that, uh, that thief, that burglar, that liar, that that you would invite this person into your home and you'd invite them into Thanksgiving dinner and you'd sit them down at the table with you and say, you know what, I know that man has all this sin and, and judgment on you and I know that you're, you're guilty of all these things, but you know what, here in my family, we're just gonna forgive you of all that and we're gonna let you sit down and have dinner with us. Here, sit right down next to the jello mold next to my granddaughter. You know what, in fact, don't worry about going back outside the house ever again. We're just gonna adopt you into our family. I'm gonna move one of my kids over. You, know, you can sleep right there next to, and we'll make a bed next to the bunk bed and you can be with my family forever. What hope does that person ever have of that kind of relationship? And the answer is none. But then again, what hope did any of us have of the realization of heaven? Without Jesus Christ in our life, what hope did we ever have of realizing the blessing of being in the presence of the Lord God for all eternity? And the answer is none, without Jesus. Therefore, without the Lord, there can be no hope. And yet people go out and they seek so many different ways to find happiness in the world without the hope of Jesus. And it ultimately, it all fails. They say, oh, but I'm a good person. You say, compared to what? Compared to who? So who's more, who's more deserving of the prison cell? The person who murders one or the person who murders 10? And the answer, of course, is both. And yet people say, well, I'm good. I, or at least, okay, I'm not as bad as that person. And they say, well, therefore, I am good. I'm good enough. And again, the message becomes good compared to whom? Sin is not graded on a scale. People will and say, you know, well, I've done bad things, but I haven't done real bad things. Well, the problem is God is all good. And God grades all sin on that one scale, that if you have done anything that disappoints, let downs, falls short of the glory of God, it is sin. And there's none righteous, no, not one. So none of us can say to ourselves, well, I don't have to worry about going to hell because I'm a good person. I do good things. I help out people in need. I give money where it's needed. I'm a good person. I don't lie or cheat or steal. 
I don't speed. I claim all my income on my taxes. I'm a good person. Well, that comes back to lying, doesn't it? <laughs> and all of a sudden, we find that we have fallen short of the glory of God. There is none righteous, no, not one. Uh, it is important and as basic a lesson as any we're ever going to learn that we need to have Jesus Christ in our life. We need to have that relationship with the Lord for the forgiveness of sins because we've all committed them. And again, God doesn't grade on a, grade on a scale. In Christ, there is forgiveness of sins. This is one of the most basic concepts that we can get across, that we need to have imperative upon our minds, our heart, that this is the truth, and it's something that we are taking out into the world around us that needs to hear that message as well. Christ forgives sins. And in Christ, there is righteousness before God because in Christ, it is Christ who presents us before the Father. It's a blessing to know that it's not my sin-filled life that God is going to look at. It's not my flawed life that God is going to judge, but he sees me through the lens of his son, Jesus Christ, because I've accepted his truth in faith. In faith. I'm therefore justified, sanctified, and eventually one day glorified, not because of anything that I did, but because of everything that Christ has done. What hope can there be without Christ in our life? Psalm 33, verses 20 through 22, it's on the screen, reads this. We put our hope in the Lord, he is our help and our shield. In him, our hearts rejoice, for we trust in his holy name. Let your unfailing love surround us, Lord, for our hope is in you alone. Everything else will let you down. The world will let you down. Your jobs will let you down. Your friends will let you down. Your family will let you down. Everything else in the world at some point will let you down. That's the encouraging part of the story. <laughs> And you wonder why we can say in Christ there is hope, because God is the one that will not let us down. His promises are eternal and true. His protection, his blessing upon us is eternal and true. And that's a truth that's worth knowing, it's a truth that's worth sharing, and it's a truth that's worth protecting. In the world that we live in today, believe it or not, church, there are people out there that are trying to whitewash, water down, and change the truth of God. We say to ourselves, okay, well, who's going to do something about that? We see these untruths, we see these lies, we see these watered down versions of, of the gospel. Where sin all of a sudden is, yeah, not really sin, but it's just kind of not really what God would have preferred, but, it, but it's not bad. There's all kinds of untruths that go out there into the world, world, and somebody's got to stand up, and somebody has to say no more. Somebody has to share the truth in a world that is being filled with lies, because lies and deception will not bring people to the gospel of truth. Lies and deceptions can be incredibly costly on an eternal scale. I guarantee you in a, in a group of people this size, we all have friends or family that are listening to messages of untruth or have denied the one truth. And we say to ourselves, boy, that's really too bad that they don't know Jesus. Somebody ought to share Jesus with them. Somebody ought to go to them and say to them, this thing that you think that you know is not the truth. Somebody ought to go to them with God's word and say, you know what, here, let me show you what God's word actually says about that. Somebody ought to do that. Here's the problem with somebody. If you are anybody, raise your hand. Anybody makes you somebody. Would you be so bold as to be somebody for that person that is hearing untruth and not the full truth of God's word? Because of this, Paul moves past us. And this whole letter, we're, we're, remember, we're in 1 Timothy. <laughs> but Tim, God, uh, Paul writes this letter to Timothy for this purpose. And in 1 Timothy 1, verses 3 through 4, he starts to get into the meat of this as a, as a reminder and a teaching for young Timothy that we can now take in as a teaching for us as well and an encouragement. He says this in verse 3. Paul says to Timothy, as I urged you upon my departure from Macedonia, remain on at Ephesus so that you may instruct certain men not to teach strange doctrines, nor to pay attention to myths and endless genealogies which give rise to mere speculation, rather than furthering the administration of God, which is by faith. 
Sound instruction, folks, listen to this. Sound instruction is so much more important than just saying somebody ought to do it. Sound instruction is so important, it's an imperative. The duty of protecting and proclaiming God's word has gone back for generations. Here we are all the way back in the generation of Paul and Timothy in that first century church. And even then, right at the very beginning, there was false teaching and there was misunderstanding and misperceptions and bad understanding of what the truth of God's word was. And so Paul says to Timothy, Timothy, you need to stand up and you need to stop this bad teaching. And he's gonna go on and instruct him further. But understand church that today, we are the Timothys of the world. It is our job today to stand in the way of false doctrine. Here's the person that stands up there and says, okay, well, look, there's the the pastor up there. There's the preacher, okay? There's Brian, there's Craig. There's one of those people. There's the Sunday school teacher. And it's that person's job to go up there and speak out against false doctrine. Is that what we really believe? Am I in your school? Am I in your work? Am I in the, the places that you interact with people on the street? No, we can't be everywhere. It's an imperative on us, each one of us as a follower of Jesus Christ to know what the truth is and to be willing to stand up and to stop false teaching when we see it being presented. And it surrounds us, it's all over the place. His first encouragement though, he says to Timothy in verse three, he says, Timothy, I want you to stay there. I want you to remain in Ephesus. I want you to stay in the field. I want you to stay in the fight because there's a fight to be fought right where you are. There is false doctrine in the church right where you are, in the city right where you are, in Roseburg right outside these walls, in the coffee shops and in the restaurants. Stay where you are and stay in the fight because there's a lot of work to do. He said, I want I instruct you that these certain men, I want you to instruct them not to teach strange lessons. Now this is bigger and a stronger word than just suggesting to Timothy that he stop these men from speaking. The word that he uses here is a a declarative word. He says, I beseech you, I implore you, I exhort you, Timothy. This is a big problem. Take this to heart. Don't just look out at it and go, Those guys are not telling the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth of God. Someone should do something. He said, no, Timothy, you get out there and implore these men, instruct these men, tell them to stop. And it wasn't just a mildly suggest. He said, Timothy, I want you to instruct them to stop. I want you to charge, I'm directing, command them, give them the order to cease and desist. Now, I was a police officer for a long time, and I get cease and desist. I understand this word. I also understand the word stop. Many of you don't. (laughs) I would have the opportunity to speak with a person who didn't have a complete understanding of the word stop sometimes. I would explain it to them this way. If you were getting hit with a stick and you said stop, Would you like them to slow down and then proceed with caution? (laughs) Or would you prefer that they cease that action altogether? And they got it. They're like, no, I want them to stop. I said, so do I. You know, and stop. And this is what he's telling them. He says, I want you to stop and desist. Cease this bad thing that you are doing. Stop with the bad teaching that you are doing. And don't pick it up again. The way that Paul addresses it to them, he's it's like a commander giving orders to his soldiers. He says, I want you to gather up your troop. I want you to go out there. I want you to take that hill. He wants us to be, he wanted to encourage Timothy how important it is to not allow false teaching, bad teaching, and wasteful teaching and lessons to be circulated amongst, amongst the brethren, or even around the areas that we're at. As we interact with people and we hear these falsehoods, is to have the courage to speak out and say, you know what? That's not what God's word actually says. Let us also be so encouraged because it's easy. The enemy spreads lies and misconceptions, misperceptions and false teachings all around us. And it's easy for us not to engage in that. We hear messages that lead people away from the truth of Christ. We hear these things in our midst and we say to ourselves, well, I mean, it's not really my fight. I mean, that's, that's what you know, pastors and preachers and those kinds of people do. It's not, not my fight. I don't want to make any waves, right? I mean, I, don't, I wouldn't want to offend anyone. I might be labeled as being narrow-minded, one of those churchy people. Oh, no. It is our fight. It is our fight because we are the witnesses. We are the ambassadors for Christ in our world today. And we ought to be making waves for the Lord. And I'm not narrow-minded. It's just that I know the way, the truth, and the life. And there is one way. 
We console ourselves by hearing these things and seeing people be misled, and we go, well, at least I know the truth. We turn a blind eye and deaf ear to claims like, there is no God. Or that Jesus was created by God, or that God is all love and all good people go to heaven. Or that all the gods that have been created by men are all God in one fashion or another, and therefore, as long as you celebrate or worship any God, that's good enough. Or that there is no heaven, and there is no hell, and this is all there is. We hear false teaching like this in the world around us. We need to have an ear for these things. And the list like that can go on and on. In the first century church, this was already beginning to occur, and it hasn't really gotten any better. Even in Paul's day, there were others who came along teaching other messages. There were people that came along that were just absolutely sure that they knew what they knew, but they didn't know what they knew. They only thought what they knew, and it was up to somebody to tell them all the things that they didn't know. Got it? Consider Apollos, who was first mentioned in Acts 18.24. Here was a guy that believed in Jesus, that came along, was preaching the message of Jesus, but wasn't preaching the message of the Holy Spirit. Not because he didn't have the intent to do it, but he didn't know. He didn't have the full truth. And so listeners, believers heard this message and they pulled him aside and they said, you gotta stop because you're not teaching the truth and the whole truth and people need to know it all. And when they encouraged him and shared with him the full truth of God, he went out, not abashed by that thing, but he went out with even more zeal to share the truth with the people around him. That the Holy Spirit had come. Here's an interesting fun fact. Today's Pentecost. As we think about the Holy Spirit, it is now 50 days since Easter. This is that time of when we can celebrate and think this is that time when the Holy Spirit, when God said that that which he would deliver, the helper that would come, it was this time that he came upon men. It was this time that the apostles were gathered together and that rush of wind filled the room and the Holy Spirit descended on man and it changed everything. This is the coolest thing because all throughout the Old Testament, all the time leading up to that, the Holy Spirit had worked on man, but now the Holy Spirit was going to work through man. What a great opportunity, what a great blessing we have to live in the day when we live. We say to ourselves, oh man, I wish I'd lived back when Jesus lived. It would have been so much easier. (laughs) No, no, running water, electricity. (laughs) But to have the Holy Spirit working through us is an amazing blessing and a gift. To have the completed word of God available to us is such a blessing and such a gift. It is an amazing thing to live right when we do and right where we do. Consider also the Judaizers in Acts 15.1. These were Jews that had gone out after Paul and they shared the message with new believers saying, well, that's great that you wanna be a believer in the God of the Israelites. Now, all you gotta do is obey the commandments of Moses and you can be saved. And they were confused because this was a different teaching that had gone out. And this is the problem. There are those who have gone out with different teachings after the teaching of the truth. And they twist and they turn things just a little bit for their own purposes. Why? Because they had a lack of faith, a lack of trust in the message of grace. God's gift is eternal and it's free and is to anyone who believes these things in in faith. But there have always been those that have gone out sharing untruth, false truth, or half-truth. I get the encouragement of this message in in Acts as as these people, as these men went out sharing this idea that they had to be obedient to the law to truly be saved. That there were works that were associated with their salvation if they were truly gonna be saved. In Acts 1 verses 511, I enjoy this because it speaks to the leadership of the church. The leaders of the church in that day had to deal with this teaching that had gone out and had to decide how they were going to address this that had gone out. They demonstrated how we are to respond in our day also, leaders of the church. Acts 1, verses 5 through 11 says this, Then some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees stood up. So these were believers, Pharisees who had accepted Christ. I know we give the Pharisees a bad rap, but there were those amongst the Pharisees who had believed the message of the gospel, yet they were stuck with some of this old tradition and some of these old beliefs and adherences to the law and righteousness through works. And so they said, then the Gentiles must be circumcised and required to keep the law of Moses. The apostles and the elders met to consider this question. This is what we do too, guys. When your elders and your leaders and your pastors come together, we address some of these things as well. When false teaching, half teaching, and untruths come our way. 
we meet to address these things. In verse 8, as they were talking about these things, Peter says, God, who knows the heart, showed that he accepted them by giving the Holy Spirit to them just as he did to us. He did not discriminate between us and them, for he purified their hearts by faith. Now then, why do you try to test God by putting on the necks of Gentiles a yoke that neither we nor our ancestors have been able to bear? No, we believe it is through the grace of our Lord Jesus that we are saved just as they are. The message that goes out there says that you have to do something to earn your faith. You have to do something to earn righteousness. You have to do something to earn salvation. Who here has a job? Why? Okay, let me change that up. Who here is getting money for nothing? But then we get the idea that we go out and we earn our money. But salvation is not something that we can earn. It is a free gift of God. If it was something that I had to do to work to earn, then I could boast about it, couldn't I, church? I could say to myself, self, man, am I ever righteous. Look at all the good work that I do. I am way better than that person down the way over there that's not doing as much work as I am. Therefore, it is not about work. It is about grace. It is about faith. It is about belief. It's not about the work. And yet the world around us says it's too good of a deal. Salvation for free? Well, it wasn't free. There was a mighty price paid upon it, but it was Christ's price to pay, not ours. There was a great cost, and it was paid so that we could be free. Today, we call it legalism. Theologically, we call this righteousness that is dependent on obedience to moral law through church tradition rather than personal faith. And this can take on a lot of ugly heads. And it can manifest itself a lot of different ways amongst believers. In the first century church, there was false teaching that was being handed down. That same kind of false teaching can be present in the church today. Right standing with God results in right adherence to fill in the blank. There are churches today that share only parts of the truth, whether intentional or not, and that's why it's so important. How do you know? How do you know when you hear these things? There are people who are are fantastic speakers that can really draw in a crowd. How do you know if it's truth or not truth? Well, here's the really cool part. I said it earlier, because we live in such a privileged time to have the whole word of God. The truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth available to us in our hands, on our devices. We have such great access to it like no other generation of man has ever known. If you don't know the truth, church, it's because you're not seeking it. It is available to each of us. And yet we still, to this day, have churches and people that go to churches that come to church on Sunday morning so they can learn the truth. And they go home that afternoon and they spend the rest of their day doing what they need to do. And then Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday is kind of a complete freebie. They do whatever they need to do to get through life. And then Sunday, they come back to church so they can learn more about God's truth. Friends, if that is the best that you are doing to learn the truth of God's word, you could do so much more. There are great podcasts that you can listen to. There are great radio shows that you can listen to. There are great online sermons and speakers that you can listen to. But nothing, church, nothing will take the place of reading God's word for yourself. If you don't got one, come see me. I'll get you one. The Bible is the source of God's word for us. It's the truth that we can carry with us and we can read for ourselves. You can listen to this sermon or any sermon that I or any other preacher up here puts on at any time, and I hope that you learn things, and I can tell you that everybody that takes this stage prays that God shares the truth through us, but you will learn something so much deeper if you take God's word for yourself. Commentaries are great, but the best commentary on God's word is God's word. This problem is not just for for Timothy's day, but it's for our day as well. There were people that are going out now just like they are going like they were going out then. Messages like, did you realize that Jesus is the Son of God? The firstborn and highest order of all creation. What? There are people out there who will tell you that Jesus is a created being. Is that true, church? 
How can we sing a song that says that they are one, the three in one? And yet I've got those nice young men that come and knock on my door and will try and tell me that he is not of God, but created by God. How do you know the truth if you don't know what the truth is? Friends, we need to understand it, we need to read it, we need to know it, and we need to be able to defend it. Especially in the world that we live in, because all those social media sites and all that stuff out there that is promoting and putting the word out there, a lot of it is putting out false teaching. And you can either turn a blind eye to it, or you can try and correct it, because your friends and your neighbors and your family members are at risk. And so are you if you don't know the truth, the whole truth. Let me be clear, Ephesians 2, 8 through 9 says this, for it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. And this is not, that, not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. And yet we hear messages like this, you know, if you don't go to church every Sunday, you're not a true believer. We hear messages like this, if you don't take communion every Sunday, you're not a real believer. We hear messages like this, if you commit suicide, you'll go to hell. We hear messages like this, if you haven't been baptized, you're going to go to hell. We hear messages like this. If you haven't spoken in tongues yet, you're not a real believer. We hear messages that go on and on and on about church tradition and culture. What is the truth and what is not? I know it makes me want to cry too. <laughs> Romans 11:6 tells us this, but it is by grace. It is no longer on the basis of works, otherwise grace would no longer be grace. As Paul talks to Timothy, let's take a look at these two doctrines that he talks about here. There's a strange doctrine and then there's the sound doctrine. Now doctrine is nothing more than a set of beliefs. What is it that we believe? Sound doctrine is this, that which furthers the administration of God, which is by faith. The word administration may be in some of your Bibles translated as stewardship. As when Paul was talking to the Ephesians, he says, surely you've heard about the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you. He says, it's my job to take care of God's word, to protect it and to present it to you rightly and correctly by presenting to you sound doctrine. Sound doctrine is that which furthers the administration of God, the stewardship of the Lord's design. It is that which promotes, protects, and proclaims the truth of God. Strange doctrine is everything else. <laughs> and there's a lot of everything else out there. They talk about myths and legends and genealogies and people get wound up in all kinds of worthless debates like, did Jesus get married? Are there pieces of the cross still floating around and what power might they have? What about that guy that stabbed Jesus in the side? Didn't the blood of Jesus like get on him? And I heard somewhere that he's like eternal and still alive and waiting for Christ to come back again. All kinds of stories and legends that get, get out there. And people create these long thought processes about these things instead of focusing on God's word. They focus on the things that may be rather than the things that simply are. They seek to answer questions that God didn't give us the answer to. The mysterious things still belong to the Lord. But the things that have been revealed to man are ours and for us and for our generations to come and to follow. God has revealed everything that we need to know. How come dinosaurs aren't in the Bible? People say, oh, they are. Yeah, they're, yeah, they're here. They're great monsters. They're leviathans. They're, they're beasts of this and that. We get focused on things that God says, you know, aren't, that are not the big picture. God's glory, Christ's redemptive blood. Those are, those are things that are, are, we need to be focusing on. There's the teaching that edifies and there's the teaching that erodes. That which edifies is that which promotes and matures godliness. That which builds us up in our relationship to the Lord. And that which erodes is that which corrupts the truth, wasting away our energies with pointless discussions. The teaching that erodes is marked with new revelations. Oh, there's all kinds of new stuff coming out there now. A new understanding of the Bible, a new interpretation of the Bible so that it, it, it addresses the problems that we have today because the problems that we have today aren't the problems that they had in the past. So we need a new interpretation of God's word for today. And yet Solomon said there is Nothing new. It's displayed by teaching that is filled with words that are not followed by deeds. It is moved by pride rather than by humility when the lesson becomes more about the messenger than the message. There's only one messenger that we could focus on and that would be Jesus. But when people that present God's word become the focus of the lesson, something's gone wrong. 
Paul goes on in verse 5, he says, but the goal of our instruction is love from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. For some men strained from these things have turned aside to fruitless discussion, wanting to be teachers of the law, even though they do not understand either what they are saying or the matters about which they make confident assertions. The strange doctrine that focuses on myth, legends, what ifs, and maybes. Paul says, the goal of our teaching to you, he says, Timothy, as you take this message out, let the goal of your teaching be love, a pure heart, a good conscience, and a sincere faith. If we could focus on those four things, and if we could make those four things a part of what we do and share and teach, not only through this church, but as we interact with people on the street, our witness would be so much stronger. Because when we abandon any one of those four things, we become like those that Paul addressed later, saying that they profess to be wise, but were fools. They proclaim wisdom of men and understanding of their law, but their focus, the teaching of the world that it sends out there is not a focus on love. It's not made with a pure heart. They cannot claim honestly that they have a good conscience and it's selfish, not humble. So with all this this speaking about the law and all the problems that that come about with the law, one could almost argue, well, then what purpose is the law? I mean, let's face it. We live by faith. We've been saved by grace. What do we need the law for? Let's just get rid of them, right? I mean, we're all good people here. We do good things. What do we need laws for? Well, maybe it was the Jewish Pharisee and Paul and all the training that he had in regard that Timothy and maybe future generations would consider that the law was not valuable anymore that caused him to write these next portions. In 1 Timothy 1, verses 8 through 11, Paul says quite clearly, but we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully, realizing the fact that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for those who are lawless and rebellious for the ungodly and the sinners, for the unholy and the profane, for those who kill their fathers or mothers, for murderers and immoral men and homosexuals and kidnappers and liars and perjurers and whatever else is contrary to sound teaching according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which I have been entrusted. The law is good, he says. And the law was given to us first by God for good reason. The law protects us. The law guides us, and the law condemns us. More than this, the law defines how very far we are from the glory of God, and it demonstrates our desperate need for a Savior. You think about even, we can get this concept even from man's law. And I know most of you out there, some of you out there, okay, three of you, are law-abiding citizens. Now, some of you, you, you kind of, you, you go, you're like, wait a minute, no, no, I'm a law-abiding citizen. Because 65 miles an hour on the freeway means you can go how fast? Mm-hmm. My point is made. That's both lanes. <laughs> so what if, what if, having been caught breaking the law, because remember, it's only illegal if you get caught, right? <laughs> having been caught breaking the law, and that person of authority comes up to you and says, you know what, it's okay, I forgive you. Be safe, drive away. And you think to yourself, what a nice person. (laughs) But what brought to your awareness that this was such a good person? The fact that you had broken the law. The law brings about the awareness of sin. The law brings about the awareness, the boundaries, the markers that shows us what is right and what is wrong. And when we transgress the law, we know, we understand the judgment is ours. We have earned it for ourselves. Whether you will like it, the law or disagree with the law is irrelevant. The fact is, it is the law and you are up to, and you are held accountable to it. It's having broken the law and that person of authority, that judgment, that person comes to you and says, here's your ticket. It's going to cost you $127. And you say to yourself, what a professional.
And yet the law of God showed us that we were accountable for our own sins and transgressions. And yet Christ appeared and having all judgment laid upon his shoulders forgives us of our sin, our trespass, our transgression, our having broken the law. The law demonstrated for us our desperate need for a savior. Romans 3.20 says this, for by the works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight since through the law comes the knowledge of sin. Having received the law, it is obvious and apparent that none of us deserve heaven. Galatians 3, 19 through 25 says this, why then was the law given? It was added because of transgressions until the arrival of the seed to whom the promise referred. It was administered through the angels by a mediator. A mediator is unnecessary, however, if there is only one party, but God is one. Is the law then opposed to the promises of God? Not at all. For if the law had been given that could impart life, then righteousness would certainly have come from the law. But the scripture pronounces all things confined by sin so that by faith in Jesus Christ, the promise might be given to those who believe. Before this faith came, we were held in custody under the law, locked up until faith should be revealed. So the law became our guardian to lead us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. Now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. The law brought about everything that we needed to understand about how broken we were and how blessed we are to have a savior. It is the law that brought everyone under that awareness. It is the law that brought everybody under sin. It is the law that proves that man is not, cannot, will not be free from our sin without a savior because we've all broken the law. And yet in faith, any who believe have been set free. The law protected us and he prepared us for the savior to come a redeemer who would save us from our own trespasses. And now the savior has come and he's delivered us from the law and from our sin. And there's a response that comes out of that. No different than that officer that walked up and gave you the warning for that horrible transgression of the law that you committed. And you said to yourself, self, what a nice man, how much more so should we be thankful for Christ who saved us and forgave us of our sin? Galatians 2.16 says this, yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law, because by works of the law, no one will be justified. What in is the law? Why, why even bother to obey it then? Again, if we, have, if we have Christ in our life, if we have forgiveness, then why obey the law? And the answer is love. And rather than me try and explain this to you, just hear the word of God. Matthew 5, 17, the Lord said, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Deuteronomy 6, 5 says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. Romans 13, 10 says, love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. Galatians 5, 13 through 14 says this, for you brothers were called to freedom, but do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, rather serve one another in love. The entire law is fulfilled in a single decree, God's word says, love your neighbor as yourself. Think about that for a minute. The whole purpose of law, of the law is love, and it is fulfilled in that one commandment to love your neighbor as yourself. You think about all those commandments, all those laws that God handed down to us. And if we loved our neighbors as we loved ourselves, we wouldn't need the law, would we? Because in love, we would not transgress the law. And yet we do not love. If we leave this place learning nothing else other than this today, focus on this. It is love, not the law that has set us free. It is love, not the adherence to policies or procedures, practices, or adherences to, to cultural traditions that has redeemed us from our sin. It was love that the Father God sent the Son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for our sins. And it was for love that he willingly took his place on that cross, laying down his life for ours. If we believe that, if we really believe that, 
then our response to God's word should be one of love. Our response to that which God has called us to do should be one of love. Our declaration that I will not stand or sit in the presence of lies, falsehood, and half-truths should be one of love. For the love of my God, I will not allow these things to go on. But we're so bold enough, so bold as to speak out against them. To be so bold as to share the truth with those who, didn't, who do not know the truth because of love. 1 John 5, 3. John says this, For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. And his commandments are not burdensome. People go, wow, there's a lot of stuff. You've got you to be such a good person to be a Christian. Such a burden. Oh, God's ways are not burdensome. It's a privilege and a blessing to serve God. In this, the law is still valid, but fulfilled. If we focus on our faith and our hope in the glory of Christ Jesus, then in love, we will be obedient to the law. Let me finish with this. I know, magic words. You love to hear them. Preachers say, I'm done. Jesus said this in John 14, 5. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. I got to tell you, friends and neighbors, that one hurts. Because in that moment, right after I've done something that I know is absolutely contradictory to how God would have me behave, in that moment, right after I've done something that I know absolutely makes Jesus hang his head in shame, I have to ask myself, where was my love? For all that he did for me, where was my love just then? And the answer is, it was focused on me. It was focused on something other than Christ. Because if it had been focused on him, I would not have done that thing. Because if I love him, I will keep his commandments. John 13, 4, Jesus talking to his apostles. He said, you know, the teachers of the Pharisees, they'd asked him, they said, well, what's the greatest commandment of the law? He said, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your strength. And the second one is much like it, to love your neighbor as you love yourself. He later talked to his, to his disciples. He said, a new commandment I give to you, church, a new commandment he has given to us. And if we love him, we will keep his commandments. He said this, a new commandment I give to you, love one another as I have loved you, so also you must love one another. Well, loving one another was easy, but loving one another like Jesus loved us, well, now that just got real. As we go out into the world, let the world know us as followers of Jesus Christ, not because of what we say, but because of how we love. It is love that set us free. And it is our love that will speak so much more than you can ever say with your mouth. Speak the words of God, protect the words of God, hold up and uphold the words of God, but let the world know us as followers of Jesus Christ by our love. If we can do that, we will honor the Lord and we will lead the lost to Christ. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for this day, this opportunity. Lord, I recognize that every day that you give us is a blessing and an opportunity to love you. Lord, I just pray that we would take today's message to heart, that it is by love that you have set us free. But that we have been called because of that love to be the children of God. And that gives us an opportunity and an obligation, Lord, to protect your truth, to speak your truth, but most importantly, to live out your truth in our life. I pray, Lord, that the, the People outside the walls of the church will know that the believers that are here today, Lord, the hearers of the word who are listening to this message online, Lord, I pray that they will know that we are followers of Jesus Christ, not just because of the things that we say, but because of the way that we love. Lord, help us to be an extension of your love into the world around us because that's what you've called us to be. We seek to honor you, to serve you. Lord, we seek to give back to you for all that you've given to us, to trust and to obey. To you be all glory, Jesus. To you, our Father God, we are so thankful. Holy Spirit, fill us, empower us, equip us. Three in one. Yes. Father, yes. Son, Holy Spirit, you are God. You are God alone. We are your people and we will respond. In Jesus' name, amen. Yes. Yes. Yes.